Okay, we will just give it one more minute just uh, to see if anyone else is uh, going to be signing on and letting everybody get settled. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining the APA New York Upstate Chapter 2020 Virtual Conference and for attending this morning's Ducks, Stand Alliance, and Dutch Ovens Addressing Food Insecurity Through Experiential Learning Practices. My name is Mary Millis, and my colleague Paige Barnum and I will be your hosts for this session. Before we get started, we would like to thank our session sponsor, sponsor Highland Planning. Without our partners, this virtual conference would not be possible. I would also like to remind you that all of our sessions are being, rec being recorded for your future reference, and attendees will be receiving an email when these recordings become available. All attendees are automatically muted, and you are encouraged to ask questions during the session, but please submit them in the Q&A box. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we will be monitoring the Q&A box for your posted questions. Today's session is presented by Mary Beth Mitchum. Mary Beth is an association resource educator for nutrition and healthy living at Cornell Cooperative Extension in Warren County, and she's currently a PhD candidate. Welcome, Mary Beth. Thank you very much, Mary, for that introduction. And thank you everyone else for uh, taking the time out of your schedules to uh, attend yet another Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> Mary, I wonder if you could possibly um, either share the questions that we had talked about and yeah. have the respondents uh, or the participants respond. Absolutely. So I thought while uh, you are taking over the the screen share and setting up your presentation, I would ask the attendees a few warm up survey questions. And I'm going to ask that everyone use the chat box for this one time. And uh, we have three survey questions for you. Uh, the first one is, is food insecurity a topic of concern in the community in which you live? And yes, no, or unsure is sufficient for um, your answer. And we have uh, quite a few responses. Yes, yes, no, yes, 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 unsure. Yes, quite a few yeses. Uns and then unsure. Thank you. The second question is, what region or county do you represent?
We have Albany, Saratoga Capital Region, the Finger Lakes, Western New York, Hamilton, Tompkins, Buffalo, Southern Tier, uh, Wayne, uh, Albany, uh, quite, a, quite a mix from, from New York State, Tompkins County. Okay. And the third question is, when I hear the term food insecurity, I think of, and you can fill in the blank. We have uh, lack of access to healthy food, hunger, living with diminished dignity, poverty, lack of access to affordable healthy food, grocery shopping at convenience stores, distressed urban areas into um, also distressed rural areas, lack of access to grocery stores and healthy food, impact on health, the inability to reach daily food needs, no access to healthy food, a mental illness, so inadequate access to sources of healthy food. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, so I am going to pull up the PowerPoint. All right, so going from the beginning, uh, my name is Mary Beth Mitchum, and um, I am very honored to be able to present to you today. So a little bit of background about me before we get going. I grew up in a food insecure home. I know a lot of people think that people in the United States don't go hungry. Uh, that is not at all the case. Uh, when I was growing up, my parents could have qualified for SNAP benefits, um, although I believe they were called food stamps at the time, but they would not avail themselves of that. And my dad was not regularly employed, and my mom did her best to try to work to bring in an income, but it wasn't really sufficient to care for our needs. So I remember as a child going hungry, um, you know, waiting for dinner. There was literally no food in the house to be able to eat. Uh, so I grew up uh, learning how to do things like garden. Um, my family had us work for farmers in exchange for food. So I learned the correlation between agriculture and food, that you have to work, a lot of effort goes into it, and from that you can have food that you can eat. Um, I also learned how to cook. When you have raw materials, like working in a farm field for um, green beans, you have to learn how to cook those green beans. So I learned how to prepare food. I also learned how to preserve food. Um, it's not sufficient to be able to meet your needs now. You have to think about if I have food, especially perishable food right now, what can I do to make sure that I have access to that later? Um, I also had to come to um, an understanding of, I love that, that somebody put uh, shame, um, there's a lot of uh, lack of dignity um, associated with not having enough food, not being able to provide for your family, not being able to have that as a child, knowing that um, I, you don't have enough. If you're going to school and your parents won't let you um, access the free lunches at school, and then you have a measly little uh, half sad carrot um, in your lunch and your friends see that, there's an awful lot of shame and a, a, lot, a lack of dignity. Um, so as an adult, I wanted to use my education and my uh, work as a nutrition educator to help to eliminate those barriers. Um, thinking the United States has such a rich um, and diverse ability to feed people. There's so much food available, um, so why aren't people able to access that food? So in this presentation, we'll be talking about some of the barriers, some of the issues, and then ways that community members can help to address those issues. All right, so the county in which I work, Warren County, um, has a high prevalence of low income population, a lot of working poor, so um, not necessarily people on, uh, in receipt of SNAP Ed benefits or other governmental assistance, but a lot of people who have seasonal employment, logging and tourism are the biggest industries here. So um, people might have a lot of money a few months out of the year and then other months they might not have income at all. So uh, there are also a lot of families who just fall between the gap. Um, they make enough to not be eligible to receive assistance, but they aren't making enough to be able to meet their needs. Um, there is also a generational dependence on welfare in some of the populations here, as I have also observed in other um, urban, rural and suburban communities. And our county is predominantly rural, but there are some urban and suburban populations too. 
Uh, Warren County, New York has a high prevalence of nutritional deficiencies among its population. Um, this is also kind of common throughout the United States. 31% um, of the US population is at risk for at least one nutritional deficiency. And it's not just a lack of food, it's a lack of good food. And I'm so glad that somebody mentioned um, health access to healthy food as an option of interest. So in this picture, um, I absolutely love using uh, this picture for educational purposes. Um, this is one of the schools that I go to for uh, nutrition education. And believe it or not, this is a healthy snack. So we ordered uh, uh, veg vegetable pizza, and then we had blue corn tortilla chips, and then I promise that is not high C, it is a V8 drink. And as you notice, this young man um, decided to pull off all the vegetables on his pizza, um, <laughs> and he would only eat the crust and the sauce and some of the cheese. Um, he refused to eat the blue corn tortilla chips because they did not look normal to him, and he refused to drink the drink because it was not high C. So even though there might be food available for a lot of our populations in our community, uh, the food that they may be eating on a regular basis often is not nutritionally sound. Another additional problem that we have in Warren County, and that's also unfortunately common among the United States as well, um, a lot of prevalence of overweight and obese populations, about 71% of US adults over the age of 20 are obese, um, over 35% of US youth are obese, and these rates have more than tripled since 1970. And that even goes with food insecurity. The one misnomer is that people who don't have enough to eat will look like they're starving. Uh, my family of origin is either overweight or obese. Uh, my father is morbidly obese. And even though I was a food insecure child, I was also a, what I refer to as a fluffy um, food insecure child. So again, just because somebody might not look emaciated does not necessarily mean that they do not have access to good food. Warren County, New York also has high percentages of individuals with disabilities, chronic poor health, hospitalizations for diabetic complications, cardiovascular hospitalization rates, and premature death from cardiovascular disease. So a lot of correlation between poor food intake um, and the health outcomes that you would expect from that. So again, food insecurity isn't just a case of not having access to food. It is also a case of not accessing, either not having access or not choosing to access good food. A uh, very large dissociation I, um, in the United States and particularly non-ag based communities as to where food comes from. Um, so thinking about food, a lot of people think takeout. So you can go to a restaurant or a gro um, uh, any place like that and be able to get food. But the art of cooking for yourself is one that has been lost by a lot of people. Um, a lot of people don't realize where their food comes from. And because there is that dissociation between the source of food and food itself, um, the translation gets lost a little bit along the way. And more people end up choosing unhealthy options just because they are more familiar or easier for them to access um, than the healthier counterparts. So in some of the classes that I have taught, some anecdotal feedback that I have uh, received when I have um, engaged in some community efforts. Um, this in lady actually, if you look at that picture, bottom right hand side, um, she has a little heart on her shirt. She was a fourth grader and I went to this one school, it was in a, a city um, and asked this population questions about what they knew about healthy living and nutrition. And I kid you not, this young lady believed that grape was a slushy flavor only, did not realize that grape was actually a fruit. So that is not obviously thankfully common among all populations, but for kids who grow up in homes where junk food is the norm, they don't know what fresh fruits and vegetables are. They don't eat it. It's not part of their family heritage. It's not part of their regular dietary intake. Uh, again, as I uh, indicated before, a lot of people don't understand that food comes from anywhere other than the store. You go to the store, you get food. You go to a restaurant, you get food. There's that dissociation between the original source of food, either in the field or in the farm. A lot of people don't have basic cooking skills. So even if they are provided with fresh fruits and vegetables, um, they don't know what to do with it. Uh, there is a program in our county where SNAP benefit receiver, uh, recipients are given uh, tokens to the local farmer's market. 
very unsuccessful, which is very heartbreaking. Um, and the reason that it is highly unsuccessful is because even though th those people have the option to have fruits and vegetables given to them or purchased at a very high discount, they don't know what to do with them. Um, so again, that lack of uh, knowledge of how to cook has contributed to people then choosing more readily accessible options that might be heavily processed and shelf stable. So not just food is a part of food uh, insecurity, physical activity also contributes to that. A lot of people think that playing outside is boring. I've heard that among a lot of kids. People would rather be inside either playing video games or watching videos. Um, so there's a reduction in overall physical activity. I've had a couple of parents tell me that their kids are allergic to vegetables, uh, not any specific vegetables, just their kids allergic to vegetables. So they, therefore they're not going to make their child eat vegetables. And then one of the hugest uh, misnomers that I have encountered is that people can't afford healthy food. Um, and again, it's very affordable, very accessible for a lot of people if they were to have the knowledge to make informed decisions and if they were to have the, those skill sets developed. But without that knowledge, without the skill sets, even if there is healthy food available, they might not avail themselves of it. So in addressing the issues, um, it is noted that there are benefits in engaging in regular physical activity. And this is not just physical, but it's also mental and emotional. So thinking about the, the whole human being in this approach. Acceptance of new food and activities is more likely when youth are part of making food or developing the activities. One thing I have noticed is that it's very difficult to get adults to adjust their behavior. So a lot of my focus has been either on uh, targeting youth education or intergenerational education where youth are part of an activity with an uh, older relative. By doing that, then the children will be more apt to change their behaviors. And if the children are more apt to change their behaviors, then the family members that are older may also do so as well. So nutrition and healthy living education geared toward youth can positively affect youth and their families. And also youth who learn cooking skills are more likely to use those skills throughout their lifespan. Um, data definitely supports that, um, and I've also observed it as well. So in all of that as a background, what we have done here is developing kind of a, a trimodal approach to addressing food insecurity, addressing obesity, ad addressing a lack of solid nutritional intake by focusing on these three areas. So I look at food sustainability, so not just, uh, I think the old adage is give the man a fish and he'll um, have his belly filled for a day, teach a man how to fish and his belly will be filled for his lifetime. So not just giving somebody food, but teaching them how to continue to be able to have access to food. Uh, food security, again, making sure people are linked up with food and again, not necessarily any food, but food that will be good for them, good for their body, good for their emotions, good for their mind. And then the last part that I think is absolutely vital is social connectivity. Um, the kitchen used to be a place where people would come together, people would meet and mingle over food. Um, and skills were taught in the kitchen. So I was taught how to cook by my mom, I was taught how to cook by my grandmother. Um, and that social connectivity, that relationship with other people around food makes the intake of food more enjoyable, but it also addresses that socio-emotional um, aspect of people that you also are wanting to make sure um, is healthy. So to do that, to tackle the problem of poor uh, food intake choices by members of the community, um, the approach that I usually take is first of all research, not only into the um, health determinants of a population, for a general area, but also looking specifically at the target population. So looking at the needs of the people in my community, as well as the people outside of my community. Once I've performed that research, I then look for grants. Um, I have written a number of grants, um, and by a number, I can't think off the top of my head how many, but probably in the last five years, I have written over 50. Um, most of them are small grants, some of them are large grants. But even small grants can go a very long way. So after I write the grants, then I'm able to develop written information. So this could be something as simple as a recipe. It could be nutritional information or um, information for populations on how to garden. So having that available. 
Um, I've also created videos, both to have posted on the website um, and also to be able to use, especially if I'm doing any sort of virtual education, offering webinars. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing most recently are live cooking parties once a week where I will send out a recipe to people who are interested and then uh, via Zoom, we will create something together. So this uh, last week was hummus, roasted red pepper and basil hummus. So people will tune in and again, that, that social connectivity where people are learning a skill but in a community, even though it's via Zoom. So offering webinars on um, information about nutrition, information about healthy living, but also offering webinars where I'm trying to get people engaged in learning new skills and connecting with each other. I also do a lot of community outreach. Um, unfortunately, COVID has reduced that um, a little bit. I am able to go into one particular school this upcoming school year. We have to meet outside, but I'm very excited about that. Um, and also one community organization, but usually I'm out and about uh, throughout the community targeting as many populations as I can. I refer to myself as the um, resource educator cockroach. You know, cockroaches can be found pretty much everywhere and anywhere that will allow me to attend, I am happy to go and share whatever I know. So all of these approaches then together work to address the problem in the community. So for my education, any education that I do, whether it's for youth, adults, senior citizens, veteran populations, minorities, um, no matter who I am educating, I uh, use this trimodal approach. So I provide education about nutrition and health. Again, there is such a dearth of solid information. Uh, people tend to listen to their peers or what they see online or read on social media or watch videos about. That is what they will uh, accept as fact rather than actual solid um, empirical evidence. Um, so I provide education about nutrition and health. So this is what you should be eating. This is what is good for you. This is why it is good for you. Then that's not enough. If you provide people information, they're likely not going to do anything with it. So then I expose them to new foods and exercises. So going into a school and making hummus with the kids in a blender and getting them to try that hummus. Um, and then a lot of them will find that they actually like it. So something that before they would say looks disgusting and they would never want to try, now they are open to trying it. Or um, going into a senior citizen population and teaching them how simple it is to use frozen vegetables to make a healthy soup. And again, getting them to taste that during that uh, educational um, uh, exercise, then they are more willing or will be more likely to then go and make that recipe themselves. Or exercises, uh, showing kids that it's not boring to exercise, you can have fun by doing it. So coming up with different games for exercising, or um, I've done intergenerational hikes and snowshoeing events, with different populations. So showing them that going outside, exercising, being with other people can actually be a fun thing. So first educating, giving them the information, second exposing them to either food or an activity and getting them vested in that concept and in that activity. And then encouraging that those people to go um, not only to continue applying what they have learned in their own lives, but to share what they have learned with others. So specifically relating to nutrition education, um, I will teach kids where their food comes from. The food comes from the farm, food comes from the fields. I will teach them, um, we'll learn together about how vegetables benefit your body and how good they can taste. We'll make a recipe together like salsa fresca using um, heirloom variety tomatoes and a wide range of colored vegetables. They'll eat it, they'll find that that actually tastes good and they like it better than the heavily processed version of salsa. I will give them recipes, they will go home and try making that with their family members. So then you have a continuation of whatever is taught, not just ending up that individual, but being shared to their family, to their peers, and hopefully their community. So how do we do this? Um, first of all, going to the school. Schools have been a fantastic community partnership and some of the grants that I have successfully written uh, for school-based education have come from insurance companies. Um, they have come from local businesses that think that is beneficial for kids to be able to have access to um, education and experiences in healthy living. And unfortunately, because the school day is so packed tight with um, activities, not a lot of schools are willing to have somebody come in and do this. Uh, the schools that have allowed 
us to come in and provide this education um, over the last five years have indicated a market shift in the youth. Uh, youth are able to uh, pay attention better. They're able to stay engaged better. Um, they've been noticing in the, the homes of these students, the families are more willing to be physically active. The kids are having better nutritional choices when they bring food to school. So it's an overall win-win for the school. The kids are able to focus better and perform better and are healthier. And you're also um, raising the next generation of um, healthy people. So anyway, go to the school. So I provide nutrition education, I provide physical activity education, and again, trying to make it as engaging and fun as possible. Also encouraging people to get outdoors. I know we're talking about food security, and, um, but it's not just enough to put good food in your body. Again, you need to know where your food comes from and you need to be vested into your community in order to make sure it's not just all about you. It's not a self-focused thing. Uh, so one of the ideals that I try to promote is the idea of place-based stewardship. And basically all that means is people who are vested into their community who um, are passionate about their community will be more likely to then give back to the community. So teaching youth or teaching adults, this is what you have available in your community. Um, why, why not spend time exploring that? Then start donating time, um, taking care of it. When you start doing that and kind of shifting the focus off of yourself, it breeds community approach, but it also usually ends up translating in a healthier lifestyle. People who are more physically active usually tend to follow better dietary pra practices than people who are sedentary. And people who are vested into their communities, whether it's ecological investment or environmental investment or um, uh, community-based uh, thinking of people first um, investment are going to be more likely to try to help their fellow community members. Another thing that we've done here at our workplace is establish community gardens. Uh, when I started working here five years ago, we just had a great expanse of lawn in front of the building. So I um, uh, convinced, I think that's the best word for it, uh, the powers that be here that it would be a benefit to have educational gardens. So if people don't know how to grow their own crops, why not show them how to do so? So as of right now, we have a very expansive garden. Um, we show people how to grow things in raised beds. Uh, we have a cylinder tower, you can see it right here. We have herbs growing in that. We also have straw bale gardening, where we'll have, and you can't see the straw bales because they're covered in squash plants, um, but showing people that you can use a variety of medium to grow things. We have in-ground gardens, you name it, we have it. We grow potatoes, we grow tomatoes, we grow um, peas and beans and carrots and corn and all sorts of lovely stuff. So we're showing people in the community, come in, you want to learn how to grow your own crops, we'll show you how to do that and how easy it is. Not just in the ground too, but also container gardening. So not limiting people who live in, an, uh, not preventing people who live in an area that might be urban or suburban from being able to access growing their own food. If you have a balcony and you have a pot, you can grow some food. Um, so showing people again, all of these different methods of growing uh, different items, we can teach people how to start things from seed. We have a greenhouse here on site so we can show people how to um, start plants earlier. We can show them how to plant, how to space things, um, what good companion planting looks like, um, how to weed. I especially love it when people want to learn how to weed, how to harvest, what to do with the produce when you harvest it, so how to prepare your uh, produce, how to cook it, and then how to preserve it. So walking people through each of these steps, and it's amazing, people who spend time growing their own food, not only appreciate food more because, again, you understand all of the work that went into that, um, but they're also, when they're exposed to fruits and vegetables that taste good, ones that are just grown right from the garden, then they're more willing to go and try to find those sources of food. So people who have those um, farmer's market coupons, if they taste uh, fresh fruits and vegetables that somebody walks them through how to prepare, they might be more willing to then seek those out knowing that it will taste good and that it's uh, not difficult to prepare it once you've done all of the work of growing it. 
So here's some example of the produce that we grow. I've tried to make sure that we focus on things that are colorful. Again, that visual appeal um, and obviously the nutritional benefits of a wide variety of rainbow colors of, of, uh, of vegetables are beneficial. Um, but things taste better, not really, but you, they kind of do when they look good. So um, showing people that you, when you grow squash, it doesn't just have to be uh, the, the stereotypical butternut squash that people expect. You can have patty pan squash. Um, you can have different types of squash. We've grown uh, regular white cauliflower. We've grown purple cauliflower, orange and yellow. Um, carrots of all varying uh, colors, beets and radishes. So just again, a wide variety of vegetables and um, getting people from the community to come in and experience how to grow these. So these two young men were um, sent over by the Warren County uh, department. They're from low-income families, so they worked with us last summer um, and learned how to care for the garden. And it was neat because when other people would come in for educational um, experiences, learning how to garden um, and, and learning in the educational gardens, these two young men would often take point and take ownership and showing what they had learned, and then they would actually go and teach other people. So again, you, you have these skills, you teach these skills to somebody, you allow them to grow in those skills and become proficient. That's not just going to affect them, that is going to trickle down and affect other people. Uh, we also have backyard fowl here at the office, not right now, as it's a little bit too cold, we usually keep them over the winter. But again, showing people that if you like having eggs, it's not too difficult, obviously, depending on where you live and zoning and all that good stuff. But you can have your own um, tick eating little winged phenoms that provide eggs and uh, free range eggs are absolutely fantastic. Uh, so we show people that if you do have the setup for it and you are able to having chickens or having ducks is a good way to supplement your diet. We also teach sustainability. So on the left hand side, you can see a picture of a chick. Um, we have fertile eggs and we hatch them in an incubator. So again, teaching that ag skill of um, farm to table that a life comes from something. So taking the egg that had been fertilized by the chickens and the rooster and then putting it in an incubator and then allowing that to hatch. Um, we've done that here. We've also lent them out to different schools. So teaching um, again that skill and also promoting sustainability. Um, and then quail we raised, uh, not quail, pheasants for um, the DEC to release a couple of years ago. They were absolutely adorable and I don't think we're going to do that again because uh, they were very cute. All right, also promoting the idea of locally sourced fish and game. I know this is not up everyone's alley, but let's face it, people who live in rural areas um, that like to eat meat or like to eat fish, one fantastic opportunity for them to be able to access those themselves is if you teach them, again, give a man a fish, if you teach them how to fish. Um, so this girl on the left-hand side was part of a 4-H sport fishing uh, class where kids were learning how to catch fish, how to prepare fish, how to cook fish. Um, hunting is another thing. Uh, we work in collaboration with the DEC to teach safe and ethical hunting practices. Um, and th there is something to be said when you go and harvest um, an animal. And again, I know there are varying ideas around this topic, but if you go and harvest the life of an animal, that should, um, give you a sense of weighty responsibility, A, for what you've done, but B, make you appreciate what you have even more. Um, when you have to work to get something, there's often a greater appreciation than when you're just given something. Uh, we also teach about wild edibles. So here, dandelion on the left, burdock on the top. Burdock root is absolutely fantastic. Um, wood sorrel on the bottom, plantain on the right. Um, you can eat all of the, the bits on the plantain, you can eat all of the bits of um, dandelions. Burdock, the leaves taste absolutely vile. You can eat the stems, they taste very good julienne. Um, and then again, the roots are fantastic. They taste kind of like a, I don't know, like a peanutty potato. And wood sorrel tastes very lemony, it's a lovely trail nibble. Uh, but showing people whether you live in a rural area, an urban area, or even um, a suburban area, you might have these wild edibles growing. So another way that you can forage and supplement your diet. Um, my family had a lot of foraging that took place. Uh, my mom's 
grandmother was a Native American lady and she had taught how to get food from the forest. So that's something I grew up learning how to do. And again, when you, you live in a food insecure home, um, if there's anything around you, I absolutely take advantage of it. But wild edibles are a nutrient rich way for people to be able to access food at no cost. However, with that caveat, unfortunately, if there has been the application of pesticides or especially in some urban locales where you're not really sure about what has been um, in the ground there, you want to be a bit careful about promoting that knowledge. But if you give people the knowledge of, yes, these dandelions are pretty and you can eat them and they're good for you and let's, let's try some together, then they might be more willing to implement those into their diet. Uh, we also foster the idea that plant-rich diets are a good way to be able to include nutrients into your, um, your regular dietary practices, but also in a cost-effective way. Again, I hear time and time again that, um, that healthy eating is too expensive, and it can be. You can definitely spend your money on um, all sorts of things that will cause your grocery bills to skyrocket very quickly but it doesn't have to be. Um, some food that is good for you is also very inexpensive. So on the right hand side here is a recipe for roasted potatoes. Potatoes are relatively inexpensive and they're absolutely nutrient rich and delicious. This middle one is a tomato fennel packet that I put together and grilled over um, uh, an outdoor grill. Very simple, it came from the gardens here at work. Absolutely delicious and very easy to make. And then on the left, this is cauliflower taco meat. So taking cauliflower and then chopping it up and adding spices, delicious. That one's probably a bit pricier uh, just because cauliflower with ketogenic diet popularity has become a bit on the pricey side. But there are ways to incorporate plants into your diet, have more plants, a higher ratio of plants um, than you do uh, other sources of protein like meat. And it'll be more cost effective. Um, I eat a whole food plant-based no oil diet. That's what I follow. So a, a very strict vegan diet. Um, however, my husband and my teenage son love to eat meat. And what I spend on myself for a month for groceries is probably about a tenth, and I'm not kidding, about what I spend on them just because they like to eat meat and meat is extremely expensive. Um, so my plant-rich diet is more economical. It just requires some work. Okay, so talking about basic cooking workshops, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people lack basic cooking skills. So teaching them how to cook is important. And this can be something that's facilitated in um, schools and senior centers, in churches even, or community organizations. Um, or I've known um, insurance companies to host a workshop where they will encourage people to come and make a recipe together. So teaching people how to take basic ingredients, and then put them together for something healthy and tasty. So here on the left is a recipe for lentil soup. Incredibly easy, and I want to say the entire batch costs less than $3, and I made a very large pot of it. But again, using things like dried lentils, and potatoes, and carrots, um, and spices, you can create something that is very healthy, very filling, very delicious, and not very costly. These are uh, roasted chickpeas. Um, just take chickpeas in a can and then uh, rinse them and put them on a cookie sheet, uh, parchment paper. You can add spices to them and then roast them at 425 degrees for about 20 minutes. They'll be crispy on the outside, soft on the inside. They taste absolutely amazing, great on salads, and they're a much more economical uh, version than their uh, prepackaged counterparts in the grocery store. Or you can take things like cucumbers and tomatoes and turn them into a salad with some feta cheese. Again, it's just teaching people how to put food together in a way that they will, um, they'll be able to then replicate that process later on. So again, teaching them to cook now isn't enough. You also have to promote food preservation. So eggplant bacon on the left, don't knock it till you try it. If anyone is interested in the recipe, please email me. I would be very happy to send you it. Um, but again, what do you do? If you have produce now or if somebody gives you food, don't let it go to waste, don't throw it away. You, you can make it last longer. So teaching people how to take food, how to cook it, how to prepare it, but then also how to keep it um, able to be used long-term. 
another method that we've seen great success on are promoting sustainable methods of cooking. This wood-fired pizza oven uh, uses wood pellets. That's not a, a very cost-effective um, uh, option for some people. I want to say the unit was $300 and it was the best $300 of my works money that I have ever spent. Um, but there are ways for people who might have a slightly higher level of income to be able to be more um, ecologically sustainable while still getting access to good food. Fun is important. Um, I was talking with my son, who's this man right here, uh, last night about outdoor cooking. So my son actually has autism and uh, he grew up learning how to cook because his mom thought that it was important for him to be able to take care of himself and to have those skills. Um, but he likes to be able to try fun things. So one thing that we did an awful lot of when he was younger, and I still do some with him now, is outdoor cooking. So if people want to learn how to cook, one way that might be fun to introduce them to would be cooking outdoors. Um, so it doesn't cost a lot. Uh, charcoal's inexpensive. You can, um, again, depending on where you live, use firewood. Um, but again, just kind of teasing people into the idea that they can do something for themselves. But again, teaching them the skills of fire starting. Um, and then you can also add in leave no trace principles that no, you don't just go over to a tree and then start ripping things down, that you have to use what's dried and down. Again, that ties back into place-based stewardship, caring for your resources in your area. But I can guarantee that this bread cooked over a fire outside will taste a million times better than anything you will get at the best restaurant. And then you're teaching people skills of cooking, you're teaching them skills of food safety and fire safety. And because whenever you cook something over a fire, let's face it, it's just a lot of fun, people might be more willing to then try cooking that again outside or maybe inside. Um, also teaching them that you don't have to use ex expensive ingredients. Uh, I created this uh, vegetable soup mix. I do an awful lot of hiking in my spare time. And I try to come up with uh, vegan recipes for myself that I can bring along with me that won't take up a lot of weight in my backpack. So this used vegetable powder, um, like vegetable broth powder, tomato powder, dried vegetables, and some spices. I put it in a Ziploc bag, and then I usually keep it in the freezer and then take some out whenever I want to cook. But just add water and then you have something that's easy, as opposed to purchasing something expensive on um, at a store that's already been prepackaged. So again, a sustainable and economic way to be able to feed yourself. I also created, and if anyone wants um, to have a PDF copy of this, a free PDF copy, please let me know, email me. Um, I created a, a, an outdoor cooking curriculum for 4-H youth, but it's very family friendly. So talking about leave no trace principles, talking about food safety, um, and then it has a whole bunch of recipes in the back. And again, just trying to encourage to be more physically active, getting outside, and then exploring their cooking skills in a way that might be fun and then hooking them into cooking. And I did not mean for that to rhyme. Okay, um, again, looking at the outdoor cooking, everyone likes to cook. There you see my kiddo again. Um, and again, even with limitations that some people might think that he would have with his, um, his autism, he is a phenom in the kitchen. He is a very good cook and he is able to very safely cook outside because he was taught and it was something that he enjoys. Um, I've done workshops for other professionals. There's some colleagues from um, University of Cornell Extension and from the university itself. And then um, we've actually done some outdoor cooking competitions at the New York State Fair. Again, just trying to get kids to learn, uh, get them engaged in cooking, but in a fun way of doing it outside. All right, so I've given you the spiel kind of, of, of what we do. How do we do this? So this only happens through community partnerships and this is where your part of this comes in. Um, I write grants, I get grants. Those grant monies have to come from someplace. Sometimes they come from the federal government, sometimes they come from the state. More often than not, it's through local community um, organizations that see the benefit and trying to create a healthier population. Not just making sure that people have food available to them, but that they know what to do with that food once they get it. So we, again, have uh, educational gardens that are funded primarily through a variety of donations, but it's not just there for us to grow crops, to teach people how to grow. We also then take all of that produce and then we donate it to a local uh, charitable organization. And again, because I know from my work that people who get vegetables um, who aren't sure what to do with it are not going to use it. 
We also provide recipes of this is what you can do with the squash that you have gotten this week. Um, and we provide education on cooking and again, food preservation. So going through the whole gamut of getting the food to people, teaching them how to get their own food, how to grow their own food. But then once they do get their food, teaching them what to do with it, both short and long-term. So getting the community invested in this idea of promoting, not just getting food, again, not just getting food to people, but when that food does get to people, they need to know what to do with it. And they also need to know where that food came from so that there's not that dissociation between the source of the food and the food itself. So some specific community partnerships that we have developed have been with local schools. Uh, there are, I want to say seven local schools that I have regularly been in. And it's either in an in-school format or after school classes. Again, we'll go in, I'll teach them something about nutrition, healthy living, we'll do an activity together, we'll make something, share something, and then I will give them materials to bring home. Um, as I talked about earlier with making sure that the youth then um, share what they learned with their families. Now schools have been a fantastic partnership. SUNY Adirondack is a local community college and they also have partnered with us. Um, I provide a lot of continuing education courses. They have a, a business ag program there. So we've tried to collaborate with them. Again, not just making sure that people get food, but that we work with them to help people learn how to provide for themselves with food. Senior centers, uh, senior citizens tend to have much better grasp on how to cook than a lot of the younger generations, but because they're cooking for one or two or they might have health complications, teaching them how to be able to provide for themselves with limited budgets and their health complications. So, you know, if you have diabetes, this is what you can eat. Um, this is how you can make it for yourself affordably. Or if um, they want to be able to learn new cooking techniques or try new foods, getting them to explore that as well. Libraries have been a fantastic source of opportunities for workshops or lectures. Um, I've done Wellness Wednesday social media promotion through a lot of uh, local libraries in the Sal system here. So sharing a recipe each Wednesday, that's a healthy recipe, and then trying to get people to be engaged in trying those recipes. Nonprofit organizations, of one of which I work, um, are kind of the, um, the, the impetus for everything that we're able to do. We've had a lot of fantastic success uh, collaborating with other nonprofits. You know, this is what we can offer. We can offer education. We can offer the hands-on experiential uh, education for the people and how to grow their food, how to process and cook their food. And then, so if we can offer that to their clients, maybe their clients um, will need something else, or maybe our clients will need something else that we can then get from that, that nonprofit organization. So just kind of seeing, I know money's limited for all of us, but seeing what different nonprofits in the community have to offer, because you don't need to duplicate something that's being done. You can always just utilize their resources and then offer something different. The county has been fantastic in supplying a lot of the funds for what we do. Um, so they're definitely a huge partner. Grantors, um, money unfortunately kind of runs the world. Uh, municipalities, again, working with them to get permission to be able to establish things like gardens. And then people like you who have an interest in maybe addressing food insecurity in your community. All right, and there are no barriers wrapping up with this really quickly. Um, I have done, successful educational workshops with senior citizens, people with disabilities, um, professionals. These are uh, professors at Cornell University, uh, youth. Again, my son in the kilted wonder. Um, older youth, whether they have any sort of learning disability or not. And then younger youth as well. It, all of the barriers that people think might exist of um, uh, poverty or disability or um, ethnic discrimination, those do exist and by all means I'm not making light of them, but even within that you can still provide education, you can provide materials for them that they can then use and make their own. References if anyone's interested, and then if anyone has any questions, um, my email address, please let me know if you have any questions later. And if not, I will stop sharing and answer any questions now that you guys have. Great, 
Thank you so much for your presentation. It's, um, you know, I love that you made sure to include, you know, underrepresented communities at the end. And uh, I think, you know, another highlight for everyone is the number of food photos that are shared right before we get close to the lunch hour. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure everyone's like, how many, how much of this can I do during my hour break? Um, but yeah, we do have a couple of questions in our Q and A box. So thank you to those that have submitted. Um, there's still plenty of time to submit. So the first question that was posed was preparing healthy food generally takes time. Can you address how families that work multiple jobs or shifts can make healthier choices versus reaching for easy packaged food? Oh, excellent question. And I can speak to this because I work a full-time job. I work a part-time job and I'm also working on my dissertation for my doctorate. So I don't have a lot of time. My husband works a night shift and my son starts work at three o'clock in the morning. So we're all kind of like ships passing in the wind. So what I try to do uh, to make sure that I have food available is I will buy things that are on sale and then put them um, either in the pantry or in the freezer. So for example, chicken was on sale for $1.99 a pound the other week. So I bought extra, wrapped it up, put it in the freezer so that I could then pull some out um, and then make, um, I also make food ahead of time. So if I know I have an afternoon on a Sunday, I might cook up a whole bunch of chicken meat and then just put that in the refrigerator and then I can grab it quickly throughout the week and shred it and make tacos or make chicken soup or different things like that. Um, I will also try to make sure that I purchase items in the grocery store that are healthy, but that won't take a terribly long amount of time to cook. Or if I do select items that do take longer, like cooking brown rice rather than white rice, again, I'll cook some ahead of time and then you can either freeze some of the cooked brown rice or put some in the refrigerator and then just kind of plan out the menu for that. I also try to, to limit the amount of junk food I bring into the house because I can guarantee that will be the first thing to go. Um, so making sure I have healthier snack options, um, that also helps. Great. Our next question um, relates to partnerships. And the question is, have you found boys and girls clubs to be allies and outreach to youth if schools have limited time? That is an excellent question. So uh, in Warren County, and I'm writing this down because I'm going to be looking into it afterwards, Warren County or Boys and Girls Club, to the best of my knowledge, has not been as involved, but I will definitely look into that. Um, what we have found to be successful are Big Brothers Big Sisters. I've done a number of cooking workshops with them where we'll get the, the Big Brothers Big Sisters and their, their little brothers and sisters together. We'll cook a meal together and then um, set a table and then eat together. So kind of modeling the, a happy dinner time sort of thing. So they've been a fantastic partnership, but I have not looked into um, the Boys and Girls Club. Thank you for that recommendation. I will. Great. All right. Um, the next question we have, and I also want to tack something onto it. Um, I guess sort of the first part I have is, you know, is as you have a captive audience of uh, community planners, many of whom are embedded in local governments, um, I'd be curious to hear what you think are some of the first steps we can take to help alleviate food insecurity um, in our own communities. And so related to that is the question that we just got, which is, are you aware of any innovative zoning, land use, or planning practices that have helped alleviate food insecurity? That's fantastic. So yes, I actually do. So I'll answer those, the second part of that question first. Um, I used to live around Boston, and we were not allowed to have chickens, and we were not allowed to hang up our laundry outside to dry. And there were a lot of things that we couldn't do. Our, guard, our, land, um, our yards had to look pretty and had, everything had to be mowed. And that is, I understand the, the, the value of the land aspect of it, of wanting to make sure that you don't have an overgrown community where the house uh, prices plummet. But if you zone things so that people can have a garden or they can hang out their laundry to dry or even have hens. I know a lot of, of uh, municipalities are concerned about having chicken, people having chickens in the backyard. I've had chickens for years, both here at the office and at home. And I can tell you, if you don't have a rooster, there's not a lot of noise. Yes, chickens do get a little bit loud when they're laying eggs, but it's not bad at all. And if people keep their, their chickens clean, it honestly doesn't smell. I've smelled more nasty stuff from people who have cats and I have a cat at home, so I'm not cat shaming. Um, <laughs> but people who have cats or dogs and don't clean up their yard properly, it's far worse than having chickens. So zoning to allow things like having chickens or having gardens 
And again, not allowing people to uh, be slobs about it, but if people are taking the time to grow something for themselves, you better believe that they're probably going to make sure it looks decent. They're not going to do that work and um, not. So allowing for people to have gardens, allowing for people to have um, chickens, um, allowing for people to hang out their laundry, which has nothing to do with food insecurity, but it does help to keep costs down. And then um, ways, steps to take to make sure that uh, food insecurity is addressed. I think just being aware that it's an issue. Um, it's not so much of a, and again, there is food available. There's a ton of food available. But if you, I used to work for a nonprofit uh, soup kitchen and food pantry. And I could guarantee when people would come down to try to get food, they would not look at the produce. They didn't want the produce. They wanted uh, sweets. And again, this is not everyone and I'm not shaming because I've been there myself. Um, but most people would want sweets. They would want box goods. They would want things that were very easy to make. So understanding that food insecurity in your communities might exist because people might have too much access to stuff that is not good for them, which is then going to cause them to be less healthy. So thinking about ways to maybe promote more um, education in the schools. Um, my master's thesis was on addressing obesity through youth education. And that's been one of my main focuses for the last uh, several years. And I've seen it transform families. I've seen kids come up to me in the grocery store with their parents, um, kids that have been in some of the programs that I've taught. And they're so excited to show me in their parents' shopping cart that their parents bought vegetables because they're eating them now. Um, so thinking just, Encouraging the schools to be more open to um, some of those practices taking place. Encouraging organizations being to be more open to uh, trying to promote the idea of cooking and all of that good stuff. Um, and then maybe even trying to just promote the idea of food bringing people together. I think there's an awful lot of division in our country and food can be a way to kind of pull people back together. And if food can pull people back together, I know um, one community or one city in our uh, community does community dinners. They'll block off one street and put out a whole bunch of picnic tables and then people will eat together. And understanding, you know, yes, we do have uh, social distancing issues, but something like that could still happen. You're bringing people together around food. You're allowing people to learn what food makes other people happy. Um, and then you can also kind of see if somebody might be in need and then quietly be able to help address that. Right. Yeah, I think that's, I'm glad, I think we'll, you know, get close to wrapping it up here, but I love that you, um, you know, I'm sort of preparing for our conversation today. You know, I was looking at what the FDA considers, you know, sort of the three factors in food insecurity, you know, availability, so access to supply, stability, do you have seasonal access, and uh, physical and economic access, but I love that in your presentation, you added social connectivity. Um, it's like, you know, the fourth factor, and I think it's a very valuable one, um, especially, you know, in times of great turmoil as we find ourselves in politically and with climate change. And um, so, yeah, um, with that, um, Mary Beth, do you have any sort of final thoughts you'd like to leave us with today? Uh, just thank you everyone for attending. And um, if you have any questions or any thoughts afterwards, or if you think there was something that I could address that I didn't, please definitely let me know. Um, and if you would like recipes uh, or that uh, outdoor cooking curriculum, uh, shoot me an email and I'd be happy to send that off. Awesome, thank you, Mary Beth. So again, thank you to Mary Beth for today's presentation on food insecurity, um, a topic that I'm sure will be of enduring importance um, as we suggested with COVID and climate change. Again, thank you to all our attendees for tuning in today and sharing your questions with us. And once again, thanks to our session sponsor, Highland Planning. Um, so we hope you've all enjoyed this first conference week, and we look forward to seeing everyone at our next session, which I believe are the University of Albany Planning Program student presentations, where they'll be talking about the trail plan for the town of Gilderland on Wednesday, September 23rd at noon. And our second session next week will be um, Harriet Tubman creating a national park for this hero of the Underground Railroad there in Auburn, New York. And that will be Thursday, September 24th at 3 p.m. So thanks everyone. Thanks Mary Beth and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.